This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Water is a precious and necessary resource. Millions upon millions of people struggle every day to find clean or even usable water sources. Though it's essential to life, water also has tremendous power, even very destructive power. Every year in places all around the world, people are impacted by regional floods. In some places, like many of the world's larger rivers, major floods are regular events. Rivers like the Ganges River on the border of India and the massive Amazon River that stretches across South America or the famous Nile River in Egypt. All of these annually flood their banks and consume large regions of land. However, the regularity of floods on these rivers has allowed people to adjust their lifestyles to deal with them. In contrast though, sudden, large-scale disasters like typhoons and hurricanes bring violent, torrential rains, causing rivers to overflow and levees to break and dams to breach. Tsunamis represent a devastating and unpredictable type of event. Usually caused by intense earthquakes, tsunamis are massive tidal waves that can bring huge tidal surges reaching inland for many miles, causing devastating floods. In these types of sudden, catastrophic floods, hundreds of thousands of people can be lost. The tremendous power that a flood of water contains is confirmed by the fact that in the last 100 years, over half of the deadliest natural disasters in the world have involved floods. In 2004, one of the largest earthquakes on record caused a huge tsunami to sweep through the Indian Ocean, killing approximately a quarter million people throughout the countries of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, and Thailand. In the region of Bangladesh, the Bola Cyclone of 1970 and the Cyclone of 1991 had a combined death toll of over a half million people. The deadliest natural disasters on record occurred in the 1930s in eastern China, where the Yangtze and also the Yellow River flooded entire regions, accounting for over one million and possibly four million deaths. These historic and tragic floods demonstrate just how potent a raging flood can be. While these floods were formidable, gripping and life-altering events, each of them had their limits. Every event was limited in the overall area affected. Very rarely have floods covered an entire province, a district or state, let alone a single country. And in terms of their duration, several weeks or a few months are usually the longest they last. The ray of hope for survivors and those who are seeking to render aid is that eventually the floodwaters will subside. The storm will pass and the devastated region can be restored. While these are the circumstances we observe for floods today, what about the great flood found in the Bible? Are we to equate the effects we see in these regional floods with the proportions of the Genesis flood? When considering the reality of the biblical flood, you've probably heard some people ask, what kind of flood was it? Wasn't it just a, a local flood? Maybe one caused by rising sea levels in the Black Sea. Well, to understand the extent of the waters brought upon the earth during Noah's day, we have only to turn to the pages of the Bible to let it describe and explain to us what really took place. As we begin, consider this thought. If you were trying to write down a description of a flood that covered the entire globe, how would you do it? What words and descriptions would you use? What details would you include to demonstrate the global nature of this flood? As you consider what you would do, let's consider what the Bible says and how the Bible describes the great Genesis flood. First, we find that the very word used to describe the flood in Genesis is extremely unique 
and specific. Now I know if you were to read an English translation of Genesis, you would find the word flood and you'd probably think that's not a very unique word. And actually the word is found about 35 times throughout the King James Version of the Old Testament. And so in terms of the English word flood, you would be correct. However, in the original Hebrew, the word for flood found 12 times in Genesis chapter 6 through 11 is a very unique term used only in these chapters and one isolated reference in Psalm 29. The other 22 times that you read the English word flood in the Old Testament, it has been translated from a completely different Hebrew word. In fact, the one isolated reference of this distinct Hebrew word in Psalm 29 is used within a poetic instance to illustrate the supreme power and authority of God. So what this means is that the Old Testament writers never referred to a local flood, a sea, or any other body of water with the same word that was used to describe the great flood that God brought on the sinful world. There was a sense of respect for the great flood, so much so that no other natural event in Old Testament history was described using this same unique term. Likewise, in the New Testament, the word used to refer back to the flood of Genesis is a unique term reserved only for the description of that cataclysmic event and never used to describe something else. In fact, the Greek word kataklusmos is the origin of our English word cataclysm, which is defined as something that causes great destruction, a flood or a deluge. Let's compare two different passages in the New Testament, each of them describing a flood, to see the distinction made with the Genesis flood. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. In this passage, Jesus used the Greek word kataklusmos to describe the flood of Noah's day. By contrast, in Luke 6:48, Jesus again spoke of a flood as he told a parable where a wise man built his house on a solid foundation. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it. Here, Jesus described a flood that was very obviously local in nature and was even unable to wash away this single house. Did Jesus use the same word for flood as he did when he referred to the global flood of Genesis? No. Jesus used a unique, different word. Did Jesus recognize the distinctive nature of the global flood of Noah? Absolutely. Now in our place, if we were to try and convey a truly unique event like a global flood, it would be important for us to use words that describe it differently, distinguishing it from normal, natural events or other common floods. While the specific terms translated as flood from the original Hebrew and Greek demonstrate a profound significance, they simply form the foundation for the Bible's descriptions of the Genesis Flood. In addition to using very distinct words, we find that in every facet of the Bible's narrative, the Flood account is described in terms of its totality, its all-encompassing and complete nature. As we begin to look at numerous passages from the Genesis account, notice how certain words and phrases are repeatedly used for instance, within the four chapters of Genesis that record the flood, the word all is found 30 times, and the word every is found 37 times. Yet in these same four chapters, there is a complete absence, not a single usage, of limiting words like local, regional, partial, portion, few, or some. These terms would be expected somewhere in the text if the account was describing a local event. So let's look at some of the descriptive phrases found in Genesis that emphasize the total and global nature of the flood. First, God saw the wickedness that had overtaken mankind. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, 
creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Here the Bible describes the impending death and very specifically who and what would be destroyed. From the face of the earth shows God would destroy man, beast, creeping thing, and birds. A few verses later, God expounds on the mode of this destruction and the extent of its impact. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. This verse contains the first description in the Genesis account for exactly how God would destroy the creation. He would use the devastating power of floodwaters. Now we can see why it would be man and beast, creeping thing and birds that would be destroyed. A flood of waters across the face of the globe would totally destroy from under heaven all flesh. That is everything on the earth that had the breath of life. In parallel with this totality of destruction, the Genesis account continues by describing the totality of preservation. God promised to fully preserve the diversity of earth's life. First, God made a special covenant with Noah and his family that through the construction of the ark, they would be protected and saved. God next instructed Noah concerning his provision for the animal life. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Because the floodwaters would destroy all flesh that depended upon land, God's promise of protection extended to every kind of affected animal life. Each kind would be saved by way of the male and female representatives on board the ark. Thus far we have seen how God described the coming of the flood, stressing its all-encompassing effect on life. The Genesis account goes on to confirm, in no uncertain terms, the magnitude of the flood's coverage. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Notice how clear the Bible's descriptions are, how that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, and how in such specific terms we learn that the highest mountains were submerged 15 cubits below the water. To reinforce the widespread condition, both to Noah and those who would later read about the flood, God used the dove that Noah released to demonstrate that the flood had covered the face of the whole earth. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. With such complete coverage of water across the globe, the inescapable result would be the loss of all life that could not survive in the water. The Bible text clearly confirms this fact. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground. Now despite the global destruction that the flood brought, God did not desire his entire creation to end, especially not for humanity to cease being the focal point of his attention. Following the flood, God promptly established a covenant with humanity as well as the entire animal kingdom, that such a total flood of destruction would never again come upon the whole earth. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. 
In looking to the future, God's promise to Noah and all the earth addressed the global flood that Noah's family had just witnessed. The rainbow was a token, a sign to God's pledge to never again bring a watery judgment upon the earth. His promise of protection used the same phrasing that he had previously used to describe the coming flood. He was not promising to restrain the natural processes of rain or storms, rivers rising or ocean waves raging. Local natural floods would occur, but God would restrain such events from covering the face of the earth or destroying all life. Within the Genesis account, there is another tremendous argument for the flood's global nature, the ark. When we consider the reality of Noah's ark, its size and dimensions, we quickly see that the ark was an immense structure and an undertaking that was quite distinct in history. When we then read the clear descriptions in Genesis and see God's plan and purpose for the ark, we can understand why Noah would need such a large vessel. Yet, if the flood was only a local flood, restricted to some valley or lower region, would such an enormous vessel really make sense? A vessel that was longer than a football field, had more deck space than 20 basketball courts, more volume than 520 railroad boxcars, and could accommodate thousands upon thousands of animals, would have been far more than what would have been needed to weather a regional deluge or rising ocean levels in a coastal area. Likewise, why would God need to bring all the animals to Noah, especially every bird of every sort, when most of the animals either had other members of their kind that would survive outside of any local flood region? or the animals could have simply migrated outside of the affected area. Or what about Noah and his family? If given even a small amount of warning, let alone time on the order of a hundred years, Noah and his family could have simply traveled to higher ground or across the mountains out of the reach of any local flood. Are we to take the very specific dimensions 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall as merely being figurative or allegorical? Was the ark to really have a lower second and third deck be coated with pitch and have a single door placed in its side? The biblical narrative's specific descriptions for both the ark and Noah's construction responsibilities provide sizable evidence and a testimony to the magnitude of the flood God brought on the world. The Bible spends 11 chapters to tell us the history of the world from creation up to Abraham. Four of these 11 chapters detail the life of Noah and the events of the flood. In our brief study of these chapters, we have seen how the details, the descriptions, the promises, and even the very words used to describe the flood emphasize the fact that it was a cataclysmic global flood. There was nothing small or ordinary, local or usual, about the Genesis flood. If we were given the task to tell the history of a global flood, we would use the same approach. We would use unique and distinctive terms. We would describe its totality and all-encompassing effects and we would provide details that confirm that no other interpretation could be understood. Now when we consider the magnitude of the flood to the same degree that the Bible has described it, we must acknowledge that the flood was an absolutely cataclysmic and history-altering event. For humanity, God used the flood to wash away the wickedness and to renew man's spiritual mindset. For the natural and physical world, the very scope of the flood's waters was also a completely renewing force. The flood affected every single living thing, both plant and animal, of every size. Every inch of land was subjected to some form of geologic activity. Every body of water that existed 
prior to the flood, whether stream, river, pond, lake, sea, or ocean, was combined together into a single global sea. What was the world like before the flood? Were there several continents or only one? What was the geography of land masses or the topography of various regions? Where were the mountain ranges or the river basins? The complete picture to answer these questions was submerged beneath the flood. And to the greatest degree, it was lost. In very simple terms, it would be like that magnificent sandcastle that you built as a child along the beach, complete with walls and towers, decorated with shells. But when the tide rolled in, it was reshaped. It was leveled and sculpted into something very different, or it was washed clean away. Can there be clues to the ancient pre-flood world? Sure. Will we ever know precisely the intricate details of the world in which Cain's descendants walked or the valleys and gardens that Enoch or Methuselah visited? No, we can't. Many scientific evidences support a global flood. One such evidence is the multitude of fossils found across the world in geologic contexts showing rapid burials by water deposited layers. Such layers are found around the globe with continuity spanning separate continents. In addition, hosts of fossil graveyards in many different regions illustrate the past presence of sudden, complete, and destructive forces. Large fossil beds, especially of marine animals, exist in a diversity of current climates, from low elevation desert regions like the Sahara to some of the world's highest regions in the Tibetan Plateau. From deep within North American caves to the frozen continent of Antarctica. While it is very possible that the continents we see today may have been more physically connected at one point, a global flood would have converged and distributed the fossils and sediments and geologic features we see today on a massive scale. Paralleling the geologic story we read in the rocks, the cultural influence of the global flood on humanity is revealed through the widespread existence of flood stories. Every inhabited continent contains past and present cultures telling their version of a great flood story. These stories have ancient roots being passed by way of oral traditions, written in legends or on hieroglyphic epics. While the hundreds of different cultural stories embody quite a large variation in details, the general foundational elements unify them into a general body of flood stories. If we begin in North America, we find the tribes of the Pima, the Natchez, the Mandan, and the Algonquin, among numerous others, having stories of an historic great flood that either covered every mountain or covered all but the very highest peak. In these various stories, all of humanity was destroyed, except a few individuals, who, as these stories say, had been supernaturally warned of the coming flood. Other recognizable elements to the Genesis flood are seen in these stories, such as surviving the flood on boats or canoes, animals surviving along with the humans, or birds being used to learn of the flood's end and Earth's ultimate rejuvenation. Similarly, if we travel to South America, native tribes in Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, and Peru tell of a flood that destroyed all people except a few survivors who went on to subsequently repopulate the Earth. Among these South American stories, the Incan tradition of Peru is one of the oldest. Their story specifies that the flood covered even the highest mountains. The survivors, one man and one woman, weathered the flood by way of a floating box that drifted with the wind until the waters subsided. As we then travel across the Pacific, we find a host of flood stories from island natives of Hawaii to Tahiti to Samoa. These island traditions recount a flood that submerged their entire island up to the highest peaks. Only a few individuals, usually one man and one woman, along with a few animals, survived the flood. 
When the waters receded back to the ocean, the stories say that the destruction could be seen. And in these traditions, the onset of the flood and its recession was usually attributed to a god or possibly gods. When we then reach the island of New Zealand, we find the indigenous Maori people, whose flood story involves a few individuals surviving a great many-month flood on a raft. The flood was brought about by a deity due to evil having corrupted the tribes of man. In particular, the Maori story describes the raft finally coming to rest and the survivors getting off and building altars and serving sacrifices for thankfulness for their safety. The world that the survivors found afterward was completely changed and even in terms of the geologic and natural landscapes. Various groups of Australian Aborigines and native tribes in New Guinea have great flood accounts, many of which involve animals playing key roles in the onset of the flood or saving of individuals. If we then move to the Asian continent, we find flood stories of the Banar tribe of modern-day Vietnam. Their particular version tells of a great flood that killed all living beings except one brother and a sister, and a pair of every sort of animal. These few representatives of life were saved in a chest that floated above the waters for seven days and seven nights. If we then continue in Asia, we find ancient stories relaying a great flood from the subcontinent of India. These stories are found in ancient sacred literature, some written in the ancient Sanskrit language, and written prior to any rise of Buddhism in India. Several of the most well-documented versions describe a heroic man named Manu, who was saved from a great flood by the preparation of a ship. Manu was forewarned of the coming flood by a deity who requested his aid. The great flood swept away all living creatures on earth. Moving to the region of Mesopotamia, where the Asian, the African, and the European continents meet, we find the most ancient accounts in the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Greek civilizations. The Sumerian forms of the story represent some of the most ancient writings ever discovered. The somewhat later Babylonian versions from which we acquire the famous Epic of Gilgamesh are also ancient in nature. The correspondence between the Gilgamesh stories and the biblical account in Genesis are so obvious and striking that some have claimed that the Bible simply copied them Yet, when we compare the few ancient Babylonian pieces to the thousands of biblical manuscripts, the Bible proves to be by far the most verified text in history. When the details of the flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh and Genesis are compared, an astounding correspondence can be seen. Both stories involve a righteous man, who was divinely commanded to build a boat in order to survive a global flood that would ultimately destroy all of wicked mankind. The box-like boat in each stories was built with multiple stories or levels, multiple internal compartments, a door, and at least one window. It was also to be sealed and be watertight. The few human passengers would be accompanied by a diversity of all animal life, Heavy rains would ensue for numerous days during a flooding period. And ultimately, the floating vessel would come to rest in the mountains. And several types of birds would be released on multiple occasions to test whether the land was dry. Upon exiting the vessel, both stories speak of the people offering sacrifices in thanksgiving for their safety. Has the world had many massive floods? experienced by each individual culture with similar scope and arrival and survival details? No. Was there a single event that's impact was subsequently been remembered in each culture, passed down as history and a teaching lesson? Absolutely. The flood legends found throughout the world on every inhabited continent and spanning all of recorded human history demonstrate that a unique, catastrophic event so impacted the lives of the ancestors to all cultures and civilizations that its story was passed down by whatever means was available. 
the obvious widespread phenomenon of a great flood in history's past can most reasonably be explained as each successive culture references it to one single global flood. In terms of the question, was the flood of Noah's day a global event? We find that both internal and external evidences of the Bible declare the flood's global nature. The Bible's precise terminology and descriptions clearly explain the flood's total effects. God's all-sufficient instructions and life's complete preservation. While many have and probably will continue to claim that the flood was merely a local event, God has conveyed the evidence of His veracity through the creation and His inspired revelation. Man can often be mistaken, but God who cannot lie supplies our confidence. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. World Video Bible School has additional Bible-based resources, including hundreds of video programs on various topics that are available free online or for purchasing on DVD. These programs, along with other print and audio materials, are available at wvbs.org.